it's a right we have, you know, to keep our privacy and the default should be no, we don't give you that information. That's if that's your mindset, then that's the only thing that actually needs to change. You know, start with no versus yes. You know, I don't want to give that. Why do you need this information? Like, why? Explain to me. I don't get it. And how are you going to keep it safe? Just question the system. Welcome to Cybersecurity Heroes, an Iron Scales podcast about you, the heroes of cybersecurity. You're about to hear and learn practical and experiential knowledge in our conversations with security leaders and practitioners and other influential InfoSec stars so we can become more cyber resilient and safer together. Cybersecurity Heroes is brought to you by Iron Scales the most powerfully simple email security platform. And I'm your host, Brendan Rudd. And now, let's get into the show. Hey, Gabriel. Welcome to the show. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. It's been a long time coming, so I'm glad (laughs) we finally got to sit down. Yeah, (laughs) I'm excited about this one. Awesome, me too. So again, great to have you today and excited to chat about the dangers of oversharing on social media and also being overly trustful in communication apps. So before we begin, I would love if you could tell our listeners a little bit about you, your background and what you're working on these days. Sure. So currently, I'm the founder and CEO of Wiser, Wiser Training. We're a security awareness uh, training company. Prior to that, I founded another company called Observe It. It was an insider threat solution that we sold to Proofpoint, which basically dealt with the risk from inside. So I, 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 I worked a lot with anything that has to do with human behavior and what makes people act a specific way within the organization that puts the organization at risk. It's not necessarily always malicious, but, you know, people did things that were mistakes and put the business at risk. And that's sort of what we were focused on. So for me, going from monitoring and trying to stop insider threat, it was a very natural progression to move to... uh to basically teaching people about how to avoid putting the business at risk. But what, you know, what really made me actually start Wiser is that after I sold Observe It and I was sitting down with my family and I had a lot of free time and I was chatting with them and, you know, doing some uh, cyber hygiene for, for my family, something that unfortunately I haven't been doing so far. I realized that I've been preaching companies about cybersecurity, but when it comes to my own family, they have no clue about some of the basic things. So for me, I, I, I came to the conclusion that security has to be consumerized, right? It can't be only about companies. It really comes down to us individuals and the way we behave at home is eventually the way we behave at work. And it's everyone's responsibility today, cybersecurity. It's it's something that impacts all of us. So this is sort of was the idea of, you know, why I started Wiser. It was, you know, a natural progression, but also something very personal uh, to me. Thank you for sharing. And I think it's a great segue into what we're going to talk about today. We keep hearing time and time again about how big tech companies like Facebook, Google and others are exploiting our privacy and pretending to care. Why do you think people are so sort of blasé about giving up their privacy on social media and via apps? Is it convenience? Is it ignorance? Is it a false sense of security? Like I have nothing to hide. Like what are your thoughts on that? So hey, it's all of that. But I think what's really interesting is the notion of I have nothing to hide. That transparency that, look, you know, I'm not a criminal, I haven't done anything wrong, but that has nothing to do with privacy, to to be honest. You have the right for privacy for uh, a whole lot of reasons, and you shouldn't give it, you shouldn't give it up. I'll just give, you know, like a few examples. Um, People hate robocalls, right? Nobody loves being called 
uh, by telemarketers or by robots and all of that. We know part of it is because we gave our phone number, uh, we shared it online. So the fact that we shared it online, okay, we didn't feel that we had something to hide, right? But on the other hand, now we're getting spam. So people don't do that connection between giving up their phone number and then getting spam. That's just like a simple, you know, one simple example. But if we take it one step further, uh, when we apply to a new job, right? A lot of employers today look at our social media accounts and make decisions, whether it's rightful or wrong, it's a reality. And we have to deal with information that we put online when it comes to getting recruited. You know, the, the, the companies that recruit us look at our personal life. Unfortunately, I don't think they should, but they do that. And also after we get hired, a lot of companies still treat public profiles as public, right? Because it's public. You put it out there for everyone to watch. So your coworkers, your boss, the entire company has basically makes decision in, in judging you based on your personal life. Again, you may have nothing to hide, but why? You know, like, do you understand that when you're putting all of those things out there, you're exposing yourself to more than just that group of people that you want them to, you know, to, to be exposed to that information? Um, it's the same thing for colleges. You apply to college and then you find out that the things that you've done when you were young now impact the possibility of you to being accepted to college. Even when you go to court, you know, if that's something that happens and then you need to defend yourself, they can go back and, and track what you did and make and make assumptions and make conclusions. So like you're an open book. Why be an open book? That's the question. Even if you have nothing to hide, you know, why get spammed? Why get, you know, called all day long? Why be judged by your employer, by your by the college, by the legal system, by like and for what? The question is for what? You're opening up yourself so much. And that's without even talking about getting hacked. Because the fact that you shared so much information about yourself, it becomes really, I, I want to say really easy, but way easier for criminals to to attack you because they have so much information about you. They can craft a text message if they have your phone they can craft an email, they can post things on social media, they can target you like marketers target you and, and get you to do something. So just the risk is, is so huge. And, and the question is really like, for what, right? And that notion of I have nothing to hide, it's just because you may think that it's more about, you know, doing something wrong, but it's more than that. It's like, it's a basic right that, that I think you should keep don't get, don't give it up that right for privacy it's just it doesn't make sense to me and and i hear so many people say that that's why i'm like so emotional about it like don't give that don't give that right up it's it's not worth it got it so basically you're advocating for think before you share like think before you drink before you drive think before you post like once it's out there it's pretty much out there forever this ties into an interesting article that I read to give you a sense of how much of our data can be harvested by some of the big tech companies. So I'm pretty sure that criminals could harvest similar types of information from your social media or companies' social media. Just to give you an example, there was an article in The Sun this year where it basically said, Apple lists the data disclosed by apps into 14 categories, browsing history, contact info, context, diagnostics, financial info, health and fitness, identifiers, location, purchases, search history, sensitive info, usage data, user content, and other data. Of these 14 categories, Instagram shared 11 out of the 14, so like 70, 79% of those categories, with other companies making it, according to the article, the worst offender, uh, according to their researchers. The app sends everything from purchasing information, personal data, blah, 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 which then is used to show you ads. So I think that just kind of goes to show 
if you don't realize how much your information can be used against you or how much information you're actually giving up. Even if you don't post anything on social media, you're still basically giving up tons of information about yourself. So I don't know if you have any kind of advice around how you should responsibly use apps or if you should be worried about how you use apps. Yeah. Here is the thing. People sometimes don't don't remember what they did. And I'll give you an example. We many of us take photos, right, with our phone of confidential information. You know, we have in our photo album, it could be our driver license, it could be, you know, our flying tickets. It could be a lot of things that we took pictures with our phone, our vaccine card, a lot of people do that. So within our family photos, which we don't care if somebody will steal, that's what people think, they just forget that it includes a lot of confidential information that they actually stored in their photo album. I, I've seen people storing passwords and contacts. They think, you know, they're the first one to do that. So they're calling the contact bank sometimes, and the phone number is their PIN code. Just people forget they did that. And what happens next is that you're giving those apps unlimited access to your to your contacts, to your photo albums, to like you, and you forget about it. And then you keep on with your life and you're taking pictures of things that you definitely don't want anyone have to have access to that. But just people live in silos almost, you know, they forget that one thing impacts the other. So I think it's really important to be um, aware of that. And again, A, I would probably advise to use, um, other ways to keep your uh, sensitive data, but it's better regardless to go into each app and app. You can just, if you're using iPhone, you can go to the privacy setting, privacy, you will see all the apps that you have, uh, or you can click on photo album or contact, and then you can see all the apps that you granted access and just turn it off. I have everything turned off because even if some app will need it and I will and I want it to have access, it will be limited in time. So I'll turn it on, I'll give it limited access and turn it and turn it off again. I just don't want any third party company full access to my contacts, including messaging apps. I, I don't want them. I, like there's really no reason for them to have unlimited access to my personal information. And and the thing is that when we click I agree, which I think is probably one of the biggest lies ever, you know, we don't read the terms and condition, right? So we all lie when we click on I agree because we don't really agree. I actually posted a while ago, I saw, uh, I saw that uh, on the internet somewhere. I don't remember where it was. I found that Comcast in their terms and condition, they were basically, we were agreeing to for them to collect our genetic information just in case you know like do they really need our dna think about it like we click i agree and we're basically giving them the right to access all of our information then they have the mechanics to do that through the apps and then we're surprised i mean they do that intentionally like make it five pages or ten pages in the smallest print on your mobile because they know nobody is going to bother reading that in font three on your mobile <laughs> exactly for 10 pages you know it was meant for lawyers to read not lawyers created for other lawyers to read not for us to read there was actually a research uh, i don't remember who who did it but it was you know in carnegie mellon and they looked at how much time will it take on average for a person if they had to actually accept the terms and conditions for the apps they're using on their phone? I think it was. It turned out to be about 76 days, like full days, if they actually had to go through and read in the terms and conditions for all the apps that an average person has on their phone or, or they're subscribed to. So it's just unreasonable. So... I don't know what to say, like, just turn everything off, deny them access. And if you really want to give them access, if you want to upload a photo, then give, you know, open it up, upload the photo and turn it off again. Remember, 99% of the people are 
consumer of content. They're not generating content. Like most of us, we browse. So the amount of time that we actually need act, need an app to access our photo album is like so limited and giving it unlimited access, it just doesn't make sense. What I found pretty fascinating too, are there's some really sneaky apps out there like weather apps that are collecting your every move like 24-7 yeah. if you're not switching that off. And even Google Maps is collecting a lot of unnecessary data yeah. on you compared to, let's say, Apple Maps, for example. Yeah. There's a lot more that Google Maps is collecting. And it if you do a bit of connecting the dots, you can sort to understand why Google does <laughs> tons of advertising and, you know, selling of ads. So it makes a lot of sense as to why they're doing those things. And the thing is, yeah, the thing is that you can still do everything you do today. Like really doesn't take away keeping your privacy doesn't take away from from your day to day. Like you can still use all the apps, whether it's Instagram, whether it's like, again, like I said, most of us are consumers anyways. And even when we generate uh, content, when we create content, we can just allow it access and then turn it off. So it doesn't take a lot to gain back our privacy. And once we gain back our privacy, we don't have to think about all the risks that are out there because we're just turning everything off and just giving it access, you know, on demand versus all the time. So you can still, we're not like crazy and saying, you know, don't go online. Don't, like it, risk is never going to be like, you know, you're never going to be zero, zero yeah. or 100, you know? So like, it's really about your tolerance and you can still enjoy life and you can go out without being paranoid. Just like a few small things, you know, and it's like, keep your privacy, turn those things off, be aware of, you know, what you share. Even when you, by the way, even when you sign up to apps, right? Or to, let's say, shopping sites or or wherever, you don't even have to give your like full, like if, unless you're buying something, right? And you want it to be delivered to you. Like so many apps are asking for your address, for your physical address, for your phone number, for a lot of things that honestly they don't need. And what happens is that if they get hacked, whoever has access to that information now now has your, you know, and then it's for then it's for sale. So I usually say just, you know, make up uh, an address unless you want something to be shipped to you. Right. Or you can go even further and, you know, have a P.O. box. But don't give your physical address if you don't need to. Don't give it. Don't give your phone number if you don't want a salesperson to call you or you like and the thing is, people give their real information because they want to be compliant, right? But in this case, they don't really have to. The same goes for security questions, by the way. You know those questions that when you forget your password and you call AT&T and they ask you, okay, what date were you were born? And then you have it. And where do you live? And you have it. And then you can reset your password. Just imagine that a criminal knows where you were born and where you live. Based on those two answers, they can potentially, you know, reset your password. So all of those questions don't need to be answered answered truthfully. So just be aware of that information you're giving. And you can still enjoy everything. It won't take away. The, the only thing that will happen that you won't get a phone call from a salesperson probably if you don't give your actual phone number. That That's all it is. By the way, iPhone now has a cool feature that I'm using sometimes where it has hide my email option, where instead of giving your real email, when you sign up to different services, it will create a random email and it will be an alias to your real email. So you sign up with that email and if they start spamming you, you just delete that email and they never actually have your real email. So, you know, that's just another nice feature free that tip. yeah free <laughs> tip a nice feature they added which doesn't take away from you know your ability to sign up to services but still retain your privacy i think there's even a term for this kind of behavior by big tech companies i think it's called dark ux i need to double check with my privacy friend but i think it's called dark ux and an example would be you agree to the terms and conditions that includes a sub clause that enrolls you into some program or whatever that you didn't want to be part of but again because you don't read the fine print they're enrolling you because they know that 
you're going to comply, as you said, just to get the use of the app or the services as quickly as possible. So it's been around for a long time and sometimes it can, you know, bite you in the butt, as yeah. they say. Look, the more information you give, like where you live, for example, well, you'll get prices, you know, you may get a higher price because you live in a more affluent, you know, neighborhood. Like this happens, whether you book tickets or, or whatever. So it's, it's really in your favor, right? Like it's, it's the more you give works against you in, 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 in a lot of the cases, let's say that. Perhaps it's also a good idea stopping to think about what you're complying with. It could happen to you in the street as well. If you're so used to complying with everything and everyone, it can also happen to you out in the streets that you see someone in a uniform and you just automatically assume, but actually they might be socially engineering you. Yeah, I think, again, it's it's a right we have you know, to keep our privacy and the default should be no, we don't give you that information. That's If that's your mindset, then that's the only thing that actually needs to change. You know, start with no versus yes. You know, I don't want to give that. Why do you need this information? Like, why? Explain to me. I don't get it. And how are you going to keep it safe? Just question the system. Yeah, just take a moment to think. Question and start with no. I don't want to give you that information. I'm not going to give you all that information. Why do you need it for? And that's all it is. And you'll, you'll, you'll be surprised. A lot of the companies will give you that service without that information. A lot of them. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but I just want to bring it into context with some real data. So I ran a poll, I think it was this week, where I asked, how concerned are you over how much personal data big tech companies have on you and only 55% were extremely worried. But again, I'm not even sure what extremely worried means. Do, do you actually do anything when you're extremely worried? I'm not so sure. But anyway, put that to the side for a second. 18% said they had nothing to hide and 25% said they're a little worried. So I want to really focus in on the 18% that said they had nothing to hide. And I know we touched on it earlier, but how concerned should we be to this type of thinking? What do you say to people, you know, who say I have nothing to hide? And before you answer that, for full transparency, I use WhatsApp. It's convenient because of family, you know, family. It's hard to sometimes change your mother or your father's <laughs> app habit. So I do use some of the bad players, if you want to call it in the app world. But what do you say to people who say I have nothing to hide? What are the dangers of this type of thinking? Again, you don't have to have anything to hide. It's, re it's, it's really about, do you want other people to judge you based on everything you say? Just imagine that every conversation you had with your mom, with your dad, with your friends, everything will be put out there for people to judge. People are so afraid sometimes to post on LinkedIn what people will think about every word they wrote or a comment. Just imagine that everything you say, everything is out there. And like I said, and the system is judging you all the time. It's not just your colleagues. It's, you know, like it's your employer. It's the legal system. It's, it's everyone. So just, you can still use those apps, WhatsApp and everything. Just be wary that, just be aware about what you're sharing because once you put it out there, it's out there. That's all it is. So just, yeah, it's, you don't have to go crazy with, you know, try to hide everything, but just don't overshare and, and be aware of it. Like I said, you know, start with a no. And, and if you have different apps that you think are more secure, use them instead. But you have to balance. I can tell people, you know, go, you know, use the most private app. But if your mom and dad are not using it, then. But again, don't share your maybe bank information over that app. Just, you know, know what you're sharing. Be aware that there is a chance of that information leaking. If we steer this nothing to hide to a security conversation, do you have a different opinion on how having nothing to hide can affect your company's security or even your personal security. Do you have a different take on that if we take it to security? 
It, yeah, it ties back to what we spoke late, earlier about spear phishing, for example. The more I know about you, here is just you know one example. It's a true story that unfortunately happens a lot. I just, it's one of the stories that actually happens the most, and I don't think people talk about it enough. It's basically when, let's say, you have a grandson and you get a call from them. That actually, by it's a real story that I spoke to that person. They call the grandfather. And they basically pretended to be the grandson's attorney calling and saying that the grandson is in jail and that the grandfather can bail them out. And, and they have to pay like 60 or $70,000 for, for the bail money. And the granddad, he, he wasn't convinced. It sounded like not his grandson will never like go to jail. It doesn't make sense. So they, he asked to put his grandson online on the phone. So he spoke with his grandson and it sounded like his grandson. He called him, I think, pop or something like that, that everything just fit exactly. And he was crying and he would say, don't tell mom and all of that. And eventually all of that was a scam. What happened was they looked at social media. They found out the grandson and his granddad, they had a very good relationship. They saw the, t- the, the chats, not the chats, the, the comments. They saw how he referred to his grandfather. So they used the same term, the same terms. And also they mimic the voice. So for the grandfather, it sounded like absolutely the, the same. So just think about even something small as this is my granddad and, and this is how I call him and this is where he lives and, and all of that. All of that was used and is still used for scamming a lot of elderly people. And this is a very, very common scam. You may think this is like, you know, one one out of, no, but this is actually something that happens too often. So here's the thing, being aware of that, both the granddad and the grandson to question those things. So sharing eventually leads to scams and hacks. And this can go downhill. This can go to hacking your company. I have another story about that actually ended with a ransomware where I think it was a 21 year old uh, kid that met this girl on a dating site. She said she was 18 and they spoke and they started sharing inappropriate pictures between them. And about a week later, her dad messaged him from the same phone and called him a creep and that she's only 16 and he's going to call the police. And that 21 year old freaked out. And basically the criminals told him tomorrow we're going to message you and we're going to do a Zoom call and we're trying to sort it out or whatever. And they sent him a link and it ended up with the malware that he downloaded at work. And eventually the entire company was hacked this way. So like here is something that how something starts on a personal level and ends at a company level. So everything is tied together. We work from home and the more we share, the more we are um, vulnerable to being attacked. And, and exposing and our exposing sort of everyone. Attacks, personal tech surface. Yeah, <laughs> including, you know, our own families and our, and our uh, workspace, workplace, everything is becoming. So you have to be aware of those things. So not only limiting what you're sharing, but also educate yourself about how to avoid being manipulated. So that's something that is also important. It goes hands in hand, not sharing and learning how not to be manipulated. Cybersecurity Heroes is brought to you by IronScales, an AI-powered self-learning email security platform that helps security professionals proactively prevent, detect, and remediate phishing attacks in a matter of seconds, not hours or days. And we have an exclusive offer for our podcast listeners. Discover dormant phishing threats in your organization's mailboxes. Get a free 90-day scan back with a detailed report. Integrate in seconds with two clicks via API to Microsoft Office 365 and see what your current email security is missing. Go to ironscales.com slash free scan to learn more. Do you think there is any responsibility on companies to also educate about people's personal oversharing and how that can create opportunities for criminals, both against the employees, but also against the company. Absolutely. And, and, you know, for their own sake, I think. So here's the thing. There's two things here. One, I think they have to do it because especially these days when people work from home and everything is intertwined. So, you know, work, 
like you extended your network into the homes. So you have to teach people how to keep safe also at home, not only at work. But I think you also have a social responsibility. As a company, you, if you do care about your employees and you do have expertise in cybersecurity, teach them how to keep their family safe. It's everyone's responsibility today. It's something that impacts all of us, our kids, our families. And, and eventually, the way we behave at home, if you really want to change culture at the workspace, do that by starting at home because security and culture start at home. So if you don't care about passwords on your personal accounts, then, you know, you may be compliant when you're constantly reminded, but if you don't have it in you, the next time you sign up to something, you will just use a simple password if nobody forced you to put a long password. This is just one example, but start with educating people about how to keep their family safe, give them tools to be ambassadors in their own homes for for security, and you will be surprised how far this goes into creating a security culture at work. Yeah, I think it it's a smart way to look at it because when you make it about people versus the company, I assume you will get more buy-in like, hey, we this is to help you, but hey, it also will protect us at the same time versus trying to push it in the opposite direction. Eventually, you know, those hacks target people. You know, they start, a lot of those hacks start with phishing campaigns and social engineering. So basically people are targeted. So if you want to change people's behavior, make it about them. You know, if you say, hey, we're going to lose a lot of money, the company will lose a lot of money. Yes, you know, that can help, but it's not the same as you don't want your kids to get hacked or you don't want your personal finance to be impacted by this. This is like a different level of, of, of attention grabs. I wanted to bring up a post that you put out recently and it went something like this. The smarter you are doesn't mean the less likely you will be scammed. It's about habits and routines. Did you want to elaborate on that a bit more? Yeah. You know what? I'll give, I'll give, I'll give one analogy is that we all learn to drive. We have, a, if you have a driver license, you learn to drive, right? So we all know about stop signs and we all know about traffic signs in general, but there is still a lot of accidents, right? It didn't stop knowledge itself didn't stop accident. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to get into an accident, but still there's a lot of accidents. And the reason for that is not because, and I don't think, by the way, the smarter you are, the less likely you're going to get into an accident. At the end of the day, it's about attention. It's about distraction. It's about a lot of things that capture us while we're driving. The same is with, you know, cyber uh, security. You can be the smartest guy in the world, but if somebody grabs you at a moment that you didn't pay attention, you were distracted by your kids, it all made sense because you just checked out from the hotel and you got that statement. So you clicked on that statement because everything made sense. And that was a hack because you were distracted. You were getting into that Uber, you got that PDF or whatever you clicked on it and boom, now you're a hack. Like it's not about being smart. It's about routines and habits. You know, it starts with routines, which will hopefully become second nature and habits later, but make it a routine that will protect yourself. Always question things and if you do that, I don't think, I think that matters more than just being smart. Sticking with misconceptions for, for a little bit here, what are some of the domino effects of losing control of your email through bad habits? Yeah, it's a lot. Oh, wow, there's a lot. So if you sign up with your work email and you, you use the same password you use for work to a random, like not a random, but to like a personal site, right? And people do that. Some people use their work email to sign up to non-work services. So what happens then if that site gets hacked, they have your password. And if you use that same password for your VPN, then they're in. They have your username and password because you, sh you, you, you reused it outside work. 
So first of all, don't don't just don't reuse passwords, regardless whether within work apps or within anywhere. Just use if it's on a personal level, use a password manager. If it's in work, if you're at work, you can use password vaults and there, you know, or just follow whatever the you know company provides you with. That's just one thing. The second thing is that if again, if you let's say you used your personal email and you signed up to a site that got hacked and you gave your you gave your home address and other things now what i can do if i'm a criminal i'm going to take that email i'm going to look in all the other database that i have and i'm going to cross reference you and i will see if there's more information about you or i can take the physical address that you provided that website that you registered and i can find if there are other emails associated with you because Based on other sites that were hacked, if you had other emails you used, because I can search on the physical address, now I can find other social media. I can build your entire, I can find a lot about you. It's called OSINT, where now I can just using your phone number or your email or your, your email, your phone number, your physical address, I can find other places that you signed up with that information using different email accounts, different social media uh, handles. And now I can build a profile about you. So from your personal uh, email, I can find your work email. And if you're using just a password on your personal one, the same one that you're using for your work, the fact that I can find your work email and I have your personal email and you're using the same passwords again now i can hack you so and that and that actually happens all the time right like that's what uh that's what those breach databases are all about we can find so much information cross reference you and build a whole profile about you and then we can go back to the wayback machine it's a, an internet archive and we can find uh posts that you've deleted and then we can find like it just doesn't end so the the attack surface, the things that someone can do with only an email is, is just unbelievable. If this is sounding like sci-fi to some <laughs> folks, like it really shouldn't because marketers have been doing this to us for like yeah. the last 10 years. So it's really come down to the cost of the tools. The tools may have been more accessible to well-funded attackers, but now with the digital transformation of the last decade or even less, it's super easy to get these tools for free or super cheap on the dark web, packaged phishing kits. It's rarely become commoditized. So yeah, all those things you mentioned, I think those tactics have probably been copied from marketers on how to target your audience and how to speak to your audience so that it's like a it's like a virtual one to one conversation and that's how social engineers are getting their man or woman yeah by the way if you really want to freak out just go to yellow pages type in your name and and you will freak out from the level of information and there's a lot of other sites that do background checks and they just made it easier for for everyone. They went out there, they did all that research, and they have a database that just using a name, your your first name and last name, for less than five dollars, I can find all your relatives. I can find everything about you almost like that is ever put out on social media, and that's for five dollars. That that's what it costs. And I'm sure there was a, a valid reason for whoever came up with the phrase data is the new economy. <laughs> it makes perfect sense because it really does drive all the activity on the internet. And by the way, you can opt out. Yeah, you can opt out from all those services. So if you go to Yellow Pages and, you know, all the other uh, background check apps, you put in your email and you ask to opt out and, and they must delete the information they have on you. So that's, I think there's also some other services that do that automatically for you. So that's another thing to check, but that's totally worth it. You know, not being on all those systems. Again, it also ends up being, you know, a resource for, you know, why you're getting spammed or, or getting calls. It's just so easy to find your information. As we kind of wrap up here today, I know we've covered a lot of um, tips throughout the conversation, but 
could you sort of maybe summarize in three or five tips how our listeners can be safe out there yeah, how, after everything we've sort of gone through, just some best practices in a summary? Yeah, I'll, I'll add a few, actually. So one is don't treat a digital identity like you treat someone when you meet them in person. You never know who are you talking to, even if you said you're, you know, you're using WhatsApp. So even if your mom, you're right, messages you on WhatsApp, it doesn't mean it's your mom. I know that sounds crazy, but I have stories after stories about how uh, mom's accounts got hacked and the criminals used that account to message their family and, and it was a chain attack. So you can never treat a digital identity just by the fact that you had, you know, a thread going on with them or they're in your contact list. So never share with them without calling them first any personal information. You can chat with them, but if your mom asks you for bank information or send me a code, call her up and say, hey, mom, did you just ask me to send you a code? Like, it's that simple. So that's... And I can speak to that as actually a witness uh, of a family member who got hacked through his son being hacked, and he wired him, I think it was 1,500 reales, which is Brazilian uh, currency, which it's a few hundred dollars, I think. Don't quote me on the conversion, but it was enough to <laughs> to cause concern so yes i can speak to that as a witness that it's real yeah yeah it's unfortunately it's very real second thing is it's simple but we haven't spoken about it but use multi-factor authentication it's so easy you go maybe it's hard to set it up for some people so but ask a family member or ask somebody you trust and start with your email because if somebody uh, hacks your Gmail account, the, the next thing they will probably do is hit research passwords on all the apps that you're also signed up to. And usually what happens, you get a, an email to your Gmail account to reset your password. So once you have access to your Gmail account, then you basically have access to the kingdom. So if you need to start doing multi-factor authentication, first of all, I strongly suggest do that. Actually, I created a, a cheat sheet how to do it for 15 for 15 apps that I can share with you and you can, you know, link it uh, later. But yeah, turn that on. That's that's a must. Second, manage your password. So don't use the same. Don't reuse password like n never do that. So either uh, a password manager or or. Sometimes for elderly people, I usually don't like suggesting writing them down. But, you know, if you're at home and you're in an elderly and you don't feel comfortable with technology or whatever, write it down, put it in a safe and just have a different password for every app. Don't reuse the same password. There's different techniques to do that. Just like we said earlier, with one hacked database I can now use that password to attempt and hack all the other accounts you have. And then, like you said, think before you share. Just be mindful of what you're sharing. Remember that the Internet like, is a minefield of hacks and scams. So you really have to educate yourself. If you don't educate yourself, you're almost it's almost impossible to avoid those hacks because they're so sophisticated. It's like irrational to avoid them without prior knowledge. It's it's like it's like figure like, those scams are like magic tricks. Like how can you figure out like what's going on if you never seen that magic before? So just educate yourself. Just to come back to your point on data hacks, just a very simple use case that probably everyone can relate to are the the airlines. They get hacked all the time. And if you have frequent flyer or you signed up for any of those frequent flyer clubs, you know, you're, that's a perfect example of how your innocence of, Hey, I'm just giving my email and to, to my uh, airline. If they get hacked, there's, there goes your, your data. Um, 
<laughs> and you're going to see an uptick in attacks personally, most likely, because I've, you know, spoken to many people who kind of correlated breaches to getting tons of spam slash phishing after those airlines uh, were breached. So that's a very easy, relatable example that's kind of not over the top of people's heads. And by the way, if you didn't lie on your security questions, and now most of those airlines have security questions. So if I have access to your security questions, what do I do now? I call AT&T or Verizon or whatever, and I have the answer to your security questions. Now I can reset your password for your AT&T. I can swap your SIM. I can start getting all those codes to my phone. Like it's almost a game over just by having your answers to your security questions. So uh, being mindful of that. I think it all sort of comes nicely full circle to there's no such thing as I have nothing to hide because it's really, you don't know where your data is going to be used, what data is going to be used to either attack you or to be a pawn in a bigger yeah. scheme. Look, you're just saying, hey, this is my favorite movie and you forgot that you were asked what's your favorite movie when you signed up for cables. Who remembers that this was the security question and now you're putting it out there on the internet and you're telling basically everyone, this is my, f and remember, criminals are looking for that. Your friends are not, you are not, but criminals are people that are actively looking for what's your favorite movie, what's your security questions, because I want to reset your password. And maybe it's worth taking a second to explain what you're talking about. You're referencing certain polls on like Twitter or Instagram well, where yeah. people are asking, what's your favorite movie, yeah. your superhero, like, or your evil villain and your, I don't know, your grandmother's name combination, <laughs> those potentially have malicious intent behind them. Absolutely. Unfortunately, yeah. Again, or or that you truthfully gave it to like an airline and that airline, like you said, was hacked and now I have access to your truthful uh, answers and I use them elsewhere. So it's everywhere. So again, it goes back to, do I have something to hide? You can't always connect the dots. And you're not supposed to. It's almost impossible. So just keep keep the privacy for yourself. You know, don't give it up. And then you'll just be in a better place and still enjoy life and do everything that you've done so far. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Gabriel. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Before we really wrap up here today, is there anything else you want to add before we... Uh close out today's episode i think we talked a lot i'll probably repeat myself or or take another hour to you know I, I can keep on talking forever but thank you for inviting me i really enjoyed it and i hope this was uh helpful and i hope we help to raise awareness a little bit more definitely really appreciate that and if people want to pick your brain more on this stuff maybe watch some more of those videos you were talking about what's the best place for people to connect with you on LinkedIn, it's probably the best. You can message me. You can connect with me. Happy to chat with you. I think, yeah, that's probably the best way. Gabriel Freelander on, on LinkedIn and Wiser Training is, is the company. I definitely recommend following Gabriel. He always has very interesting posts and he has a really uh, cool community that he's been building. So we'll definitely add those to the show notes. So thank you so much again, Gabriel, for taking the time to join us on Cybersecurity Heroes. And to the rest of you, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. That's a wrap for this episode of Cybersecurity Heroes, practical and experiential knowledge on a day in the life of security heroes. Catch our next episode by subscribing or following through your favorite podcast platform. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating for the show. They really help a lot. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.